big smile on my face. Tom Toomey was a civic leader, a visionary, who championed the library as a critical resource in the town's profile. His commitment to this vision has made possible the vitality of today's library. Thank you to the library board for offering me this opportunity to examine with this panel of climate change specialists the challenges we face in our coastal community. Thank you to the library's Long Island Collection for making these images of the 1938 hurricane available. There could be no more effective way to launch today's conversation. Let's not forget the last challenge to our coastline, Sandy, was just, it was just a tropical storm. Thank you to our supervisor, Larry Cantwell, who would all Today's panel is very long on expertise and reputation, but really short on time at the podium. One hour, 15 minutes, including questions and answers. I have changed my role from moderator to the role of enforcer. Tool number one. What does this mean to you, the audience? Speaker credentials will be brief on introduction. Expertise will be very well demonstrated with each presentation. The bell, tool number two, will signal three minutes left to the conclusion of each 15-minute presentation. Question and answers will follow the presentations. You, the audience, are very much a part of this conversation. We look forward to your participation, but Keep your questions short and focused. We all have stories about the impact of climate change in our backyards. But as this afternoon winds down, there is no time to share them. My goal is to continue this conversation in our community as we strive collectively to find the most effective way to serve our precious environment. Now, let the conversation begin with Dan Bader, a research analyst at Columbia University's Center for Climate Systems Research. I'll share a little personal story. Um, when I was growing up, going to the beach, and, and going to the beach meant for me to come to my grandparents' beach home here in the Hamptons. It's in Amagansett, the third home from the right, your right. So I spent number, a number of summers out here. I know this area. It's really special to me. And to be able to give back as a scientist to help this community plan for the future is even a greater opportunity. So thank you for having me. Um, let's get started. I have a job here today. And the job here is to communicate effectively, communicate complex climate science into usable information. 
that could be used for planning. Past and present day events reveal that Long Island is vulnerable to a range of climate hazards. We know the storms that impact us here on Long Island. We know the events that cause disruptions in our life. It's not unfamiliar to us. We've seen these changes in the past. Our future climate projections, which are grounded in well understood science, show increasing climate risks in the coming decades. The events we see now are projected to not only continue, but perhaps accelerate into the future. The same events now continuing and growing in the future. Our response requires scientist and stakeholder interactions. Providing the science is the foundation. The science information, the projections for the future are what you can plan from. But as scientists, we need to interact with the community to find out what the most useful information for them is. So it's a back and forth conversation, an integrated approach that can enable a planning process to begin. Let's take a look at some of the climate hazards we're all familiar with here in Long Island. Uh, we face heat waves in the summer, um, snowfall during the winter. This winter was a heavy snow winter, especially out here in the East End in the January 27th storm. Heavy rainfall. These are some images from the August 2014 rainfall event in Islip where they received 13 inches of rain and that was just over a short number of hours. There's an inch of rain in just about nine minutes. So we see heavy rainfall events. And we also experience hurricanes. There's a satellite image of Sandy just before making landfall in New Jersey. And the fa fascinating materials here in the library, just observing before speaking today, of the 1938 hurricane, which is arguably one of the worst we've seen in our region and is responsible for changing our coastline. Um, we understand these events. We face them every year. There's one important thing to note here, though. We're not at the point where we can attribute any single one of these events to climate change. Just because this past winter was cold doesn't mean we're in a long-term warming trend. These are individual weather events. When we talk about climate and climate change, we look at the statistics of these individual weather events with time. As you go into the community, and you often hear this question as a scientist, how could global warming be happening? It's so cold this winter. It's just one instance. Look at the longer term trend, weather versus climate, a fundamental concept as we move forward into the planning efforts. Take a look at our observed trends. The data here is for the Bridgehampton Weather Station, which has over 100 years of weather. Annual temperatures have increased about 4 degrees since the start of the last century. Precipitation is increasing as well, but the most important thing to note with precipitation is how the variability is increased. What does that mean? Let's say after two wet years, a dry year always follows. In today's climate, we might get three wet years in a row. It's not as predictable as it once was, and that makes an implication for planning. Think, if you're a farmer, you see your two wet years, you're expecting dry, and now you get wet, you're left in a tough position. Increased variability, and we're also seeing an increase in the number of heavy rainfall events. These extreme intense downpours have increased over 70% in the Northeast since about 1960. That's the highest rate of increase in the entire country. Um, for our coastal communities, sea level rise. This is the observed sea level rise trend at the Battery in New York City. That's our best long-term tide gauge around here. Montauk Point only goes out to about 1950. But the rate of sea level rise is comparable ac across the island. Um, about a foot of sea level rise since 1900. Um, that's faster than the global average. The globe has only seen between 5 and 7 inches over the same time period. A lot of this is due to the warming of the oceans. But recently, the loss of land-based ice from the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland is the primary driver of this trend. There's also some local processes going on as well. Um, if you want to make a quick connection between Sandy and climate change, while we can't attribute the storm, if you think about a foot of sea level rise, it's like raising a basketball court one foot higher. I still couldn't dunk, but if I were able to, I'd be able to do easier. It's now a foot easier to flood a larger area. What's behind all of this? What's, what's driving our science as scientists? And now, I know in limited time I'm not going to get into the specifics here, but I want to illustrate to you that the climate information we provide is grounded in well-understood principles. We know how the planet system works. 
Um, this is a slide illustrating the greenhouse effect. I don't want to get into it. Um, but we understand how our climate system works. We know what the drivers are. We know that concentrations of greenhouse gases have a feedback. And with that information, we can model it with time. Of course, there are uncertainties. It's not perfect to, there's no way to predict what the weather in 2035 on April 25th is going to be. We can have an understanding of what our future holds. It's grounded in well-understood principles. We use a number of climate models and a number of future scenarios. So we're presenting always across a range of potential outcomes. We're never just providing a single number. And this is something we hear from the stakeholders. They want a 90th percentile value. We can provide that. We can give you a 10th percentile outcome. It's an integrated process, but it's all driven by well-understood science and this fundamental principle of the greenhouse effect which is the Earth has a blanket. Our atmosphere is a blanket. It keeps the planet warm enough to be habitable. And we've thrown an extra warm, like the blanket you've put on every night this past winter when it was so cold. We are in that extra warm blanket now. And the planet's warming as a response to that. Well understood science drives our projections. What do we project for the future? They illustrate, the climate projections illustrate a broad-based acceleration of climate change in the coming decades. Uh, significant risks for Long Island include heat waves, extreme precipitation events, and coastal flooding. Just a small shift in the mean temperature, for example, makes a big difference when it comes to extreme events. Let's look at days over 90 that has a planning implication. Think about all the days that are 89 degrees in our current climate. If we just warm two degrees, they're all now days over 90. They're all 91 degrees. Small shift in the mean can make a big sh shift in your extreme events, which have the greatest implication. The projections, all the science I'm showing you today is online. Through the New York City Panel on Climate Change and the New York State Climate Adaptation Assessment, the Climate Report, it's all local information. It's valid specifically for Long Island, New York, and the metro region. These are local projections. It's not global. It's for your backyard. It is the closest information you can find for climate change in this area. Taking a quick run through of what our projections are for the 2080s. Now, this 2080s period is a 30-year period between 2070 and 2099. We look over a 30-year period to average out the year-to-year -year variability and get the true change signal. Uh, sea level rise is a 10-year average. This is cutting-edge science. The methodologies that we used and developed for the city of New York in their planning are state of the science. The methodology for sea level rise is cutting edge. It's in line with what they're doing at the global level. This is the best information we can have and use in our planning. These are the 90th percentile projections, so the high end by the 2080s. So there is part of the distribution that falls below this. Annual temperature increases of 10 degrees out by the end of the century. Annual precipitation increases between 5 and 10 percent. Not shown here, but the most important change in precipitation is going to be a continuation of the increasing number of heavy rainfall events. Those are projected to increase in the future. The big numbers, sea level rise, coastal communities, sea level rise of up to 58 inches by the 2080s. That's five feet. Yes, that's the high end. If you looked at the middle range, it's between a foot and a half and three feet. Um, those are pretty significant numbers. And if you go out to 2100, it gets higher. It's closer to six feet in our projections. We face an extreme risk as a coastal community. Just, because, just with an increase in sea level rise alone, just increasing mean sea level, not changing storms is going to increase the frequency of coastal flooding. The current one in a hundred year storm, and that does not mean a storm that happens every hundred years. It means it's a storm that has a 1% chance of occurring each year. Why does that matter? Because over a hundred years, you would expect that storm to happen once. But it could happen even with a 1% chance that you can get two consecutive years or years within a close proximity of one other where the storm event hits. Um, that storm is supposed to, is projected to increase between 10 and 15 times more often in the future. These are some broader projections for the North Atlantic Basin but have implications here for Long Island. Hurricanes, it's more likely than not that the uh, there will be an increase in the number of the most intense storms. These are the category four and five storms already increasing in the basin, projected to increase in the future. 
However, it's unknown how the total number of tropical cyclones in the basin will change. Um, these are staggering numbers. They need a response. They, they justify a response, and any response that is made must be based on them. It's this science that we plan for for the future. But we don't plan for just one number. We don't plan for just five feet of sea level rise, because if it's under, we've wasted resources and we're left overprepared. And if it's over, we're left underprepared. We need flexibility. And I think the other panelists will start talking about a response. The way our numbers and our science is utilized is for adaptation planning. That's one way, preparing to build resilience for future change, a changed environment. But there's also mitigation, reducing our emissions. And a combined approach is what's needed to take place in the future. And the combined approach needs to be based on this science right here, well understood. We understand on Long Island how the climate has changed in the past. It's changing now. It's projected to change in the future. It's time to make a response. A little personal connection to end my time here. Um, that's a picture of yours, yours truly, deep, deep, in, deep in thought at probably age seven at my grandparents' beach house. And um, no, I didn't know I would be here one day in East Hampton. I liked weather since I was a little kid, but I would have had no idea that I would come to an audience like this in a place special to me. Um, it's a community approach. Let's take the changes. Let's take the science. It's my job to give it to you as best possible, as clear as possible. And 15 minutes is certainly not long enough. Linda heard me speak for 40 minutes on the same talk the other day, so I hope it was understandable and is usable. I'd be happy to ask any questions, not only during the question and answer period, but also uh, here after the talk. So thank you again for having me. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to borrow two of your minutes. I made, I made a mistake. Sheila, OK, I can do it without. Sheila, we forgot. We forgot to do the introduction. <laughs> so we're still here, but Sheila didn't. And I thank Sheila very much. She did not get her chance to introduce this series and to introduce me. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. OK. Bram Gunther. No. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody, I've got everybody on edge. Bram Gunther is Chief of Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources for the New York City Parks Department, and Bram's associate from the Natural Areas Conservancy, Amanda Bailey, is a coastal resilience landscape architect. Hi, can you hear me? Great. Uh, first, thank you to the library for having us here. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Janet Ross, for inviting us. I really appreciate it. And I think Dan set me up, very set both of us up very well. Um, we are land managers. That is how I refer to myself. Uh, and we use the science that scientists like Dan and all his cohorts, and we work with them regularly. We consume that information and we translate that into our land management. Oh, I got to get the PowerPoint up, sorry. Which one is it, Amanda? OK. Is that coming up? I did. OK. Get this out of the way. My relationship with technology. OK, where's slideshow? This Okay. Um, as, as you heard, um, I represent, I have two hats. I'm the Chief of Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources for the New York City Parks Department and also President of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Amanda and I are going to focus on some of the work that the Conservancy is doing. Like any public-private pu private partnership in New York Project City that we're working on, which is called the Restoration Opportunities Inventory, and then talk about some of her conceptual designs. 
So these pictures, I'm sure you've seen them before, and if you haven't, this gives you a sense of some of the damage that we experienced from Sandy along our coastline. It was unprecedented, although I want to briefly add that we had si similar levels of damage during Hurricane Irene. Hurricane Irene for us was more about water, and Sandy was more about wind, and they were in different places. But it was Sandy that really sort of galvanized the city to start addressing, as Dan said, start thinking of planning and addressing climate change specifically. But in New York City, it's actually climate change combined with density. And some of you have heard plan about Plan YC that Mayor Bloomberg issued in 2007. That was a direct result of the city's density increasing over time. The other response, the Strategic Initiative for Resilience and Recovery, Recovery and Resilience, was a direct reaction to Sandy. And I will get into that quickly. I did want to give some context. So these, I, I presume many of you have seen the FEMA maps, where the flood zones are. If you live here full time, if you're here part time and in New York City part time, you clearly have seen some of this. The point I want to make here is that, and I hope you can see it, that where FEMA zones are, are almost directly correlated to where New York City's historic wetlands were. And so 90% of New York City's wetlands are gone since the turn of the century. And so when you are thinking about what we do, which is nature-based design and planning to make New York City more resilient, you need to look at this type of information to make good decisions. Exactly what uh, Dan was talking about, the use of information. What I've put on the left, and we can talk about this either after the presentation or about the Q, uh, during the Q&A a bit, are some of the initiatives that New York City and the region have taken as a direct result of climate change and Sandy. I'll only point one or two out. Um, the Department of the Interior put aside $100 million for cities to do nature-based restoration uh, we got $10 million to restore about 25 acres of critical wetlands in the Rockaways. That's through the NIFWIF grants. Another thing that we have done um, is we are working for the Trust for Public Land to study what, for the green infrastructure that existed, and by green infrastructure I mean parts of the infrastructure that have been turned green either recently through some of our engineering work or over time have been put away as parkland. How well did they do in actually protecting our neighborhoods? So lots of this is going on as we speak, and it is that intersection, as Dan said, between science, land management, decision making, politics, and community engagement. So I want to give this brief story here. This uh, is Gerritsen Creek in Marine Park in Brooklyn. Marine Park is the largest park in Brooklyn, about 250 acres larger than Prospect. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Prospect Park. Uh, this Gerritsen Creek is an important wetland as part of that ecosystem. The picture to the left was the way it looked after it was closed as a landfill. It was made a landfill during the Moses era in about 1940s. It closed in the 1980s. It took us about 12 to 13 years to put together all the money. The middle picture is a few weeks after we restored, it's about 23 acres of grasslands, um, wet, well, uh, maritime grasslands and wetlands, and that is the day after Sandy. So although I do not have the science to tell you that that wetland directly protected the neighborhood above it, we do know that it acts as a real buffer and that it is absolutely important in our future strategies to make New York City a resilient and safer place. OK, a quick uh, introduction to the Natural Areas Conservancy, which is the project Amanda is going to talk about. So traditionally, the first great conservancy was the Central Park Conservancy, Prospect Park Alliance. You can see that both those conservancies are focused on one spot, these individual parks. What makes the Natural Areas Conservancy special is that our focus is citywide. And here's a good point. This is a good moment to point out how special the ecosystem is, the ecology is of New York City. The top of the Bronx, which is the top part of the map, and the lower part of Staten Island. Top part of the Bronx is the lowest end, the southern end of the New England region. Staten Island is the most northern part of the Mid-Atlantic region. At the same time, it's where the Great Hudson River meets the Atlantic Ocean. 
It's one of the most special and unique ecosystem areas along the eastern seaboard, and it's one of the reasons we have such incredible biodiversity. The Natural Areas Conservancy works with the Parks Department to practice good science-based driven planning and management of these 10,000 acres of natural areas, which is part of the Parks Department's portfolio. The Natural Areas Conservancy use science -based, advances science-based regional planning works with the agency to ensure healthy forests. We just are finishing up the Million Trees Initiative. 500,000 of those trees will be planted in natural areas. If we don't manage them, it's a waste of money. Coastal-based resilience, which Amanda's going to talk about more, and then creating a citywide constituency focused on the protection and long-term sustainability of our natural areas. This is where I hand it over to Amanda. Hello, my name is Amanda Bailey, and I'm going to go as quick as possible. I see I have seven minutes, so I can see that thing ticking away in the, the corner of my eye. Okay, my name is Amanda Bailey. I'm a landscape designer tasked with creating designs for coastal wetlands. That what you, that's the habitat that you see here in this picture. Actually, that's um, salt marsh there on the left that we have in Long that you have in Long Island, and in our neck of the woods, that's Pelham Bay Park, the one to the right of it. So I'm creating designs that visually communicate planned restoration for a site. This includes a physical layout and sizing of planting areas, areas requiring placement of sand or removal of fill, uh, locations for public access and trails. Um, next. So um, there is a restoration opportunities inventory um, and guided by this inventory, which I'll explain next, and it's synthesis of all the expert information by park staff and regional scientists and planners, I am creating designs that restore and enhance New York City's wetlands. Again, this is a critical undertaking for the Natural Areas Conservancy, providing urban natural resource managers with the tools like the inventory and the designs to sustain the city's coastal wetlands, especially important to buffer that next storm. So um, the inventory has told us that there are about 450 acres of coastal wetland restoration um, within New York City's parkland that we see here on this map. Um, there are a range of opportunities remaining for coastal wetland restoration. In fact, uh, the large darker blue circles are those sites that are greater than 15 acres in size. This, this photo here is showing you the existing condition of one of these sites that needs to be restored. Uh, many of these sites have multiple ecosystem types, such as not, it's primarily salt marsh, but it's also coastal forest, and there's other opportunities such as fill removal and debris removal, sand placement to replace lost marsh. The inventory contains over a hundred criteria for each of those potential restoration sites. Um, here are some of the fields that directly inform prioritization. Which sites have the largest area and the lowest cost per acre? Which sites have the best potential for near-term funding falling within the regional plans developed by the Conservancy's partners and city agencies? How close is that site to other ecologically sensitive areas? Is it a site wedged between roads and development cut off from surrounding natural areas? Or is it a site located along a wildlife corridor where there is a connection of habitat across a network of open space parcels? What is the existing land cover of that site? Is it mostly developed, such as an abandoned lot or an underutilized lawn? Or is it an existing wetland vulnerable to impacts that need to be restored? The design of New York City's coastal wetlands require working in two scales at once. So for example, this is um, a regional plan for four sparrow marsh. This is in uh, Jamaica Bay in Brooklyn, New York City. Um, and what we're showing here is, so four sparrow marsh is the red, within the red dotted line, and it's along an inlet of Jamaica Bay. And you can see the green spaces, um, those natural areas of southeast Brooklyn. Um, and you can see how four sparrow is interconnected within this network of um, natural areas. And so by seeing this kind of regional perspective, it underscores the need to create high value habitat within that wedge of four sparrow to contribute to the productive, diverse, and resilient Jamaica Bay wetland system 
overall. So now we're flying from Jamaica Bay and um, Queens all the way up to the Bronx in Turtle Cove, and that was in Pelham Bay Cove. That was that first photo I showed. Um, so this is an example of a site-specific design. We went from regional, now we're going to the site. And I'm developing um, up to 60 of these designs for those coastal wetland sites throughout the city. Um, so each design embodies the conservancy's in-depth knowledge to inform the best design for a successful, durable wetland in New York City. Depicting the form and function of a wetland on a design is the literal interpre interpretation of a suite of regional initiatives put forth by the city and the region. That's what Brian was talking about with that TPLGI study, et cetera. And we can talk more after. Um, I have three minutes left. OK, so as we see here, we have the uh, light green area is the existing salt marsh today. And what we're saying here is to create wetlands where there are not wetlands now in that darker blue area. So to expand the existing footprint of the salt marsh. We also have in orange is the um, coastal forest restoration. And we're stringing a, a, a nature trail in purple throughout the site. There's an offshore breakwater. This is, um, this is some uh, form of porous hard material, but it could also um, be home to mussels and oysters that filter and remove pollutants from the water. Um, I'll end it with Sunset Cove. This is, this is a site with dedicated funding, and it's going to actually be construction, go into construction. It's not just a concept plan. This is a site that is going to become a real salt marsh. Um, with the expertise and data input from the Conservancy, our team was best positioned to win a multi-million dollar grant to restore salt marsh and forest at Sunset Cove. This is actually in Jamaica Bay, so we're back in Jamaica Bay, and it's in, within the red circle. Um, so we are nearing completion for the construction drawing set that I'm working on right now. Um, and it's going to go into construction in fall of 2016. Um, so we can talk more after. But that's, that's so I am going to very quickly end by offering everybody tours of some of these sites that we're talking about. The interconnectedness between Long Island and New York City, I hope, is apparent to everybody. They can't just be artificially separated for any reason, particularly from the ecological perspective. So if you want to see some, there's Alley Creek, which is an extremely important ecosystem that links these two regions. Or walk with us in Prospect Park and hear more in depth about some of the things that we do, how we survive, where we get our grant money from, who is supporting us. I invite you to either one of these tours. Just let us know. I will give out my card afterwards. Thank you so much for listening. Gordian Rack is the executive director of Renewable Energy Long Island. There we go. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, not climate change itself, but solutions to climate change, and specifically what we are planning to do here in East Hampton Township. The, uh, the current business model that we have when it comes to energy is uh, basically unsustainable. We know that uh, we put 90 million tons of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every day by burning fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil, natural gas. Here's a picture that shows the last 800,000 years. The blue curve indicates carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. It's been always between 180 and about 300 parts per million for all of that history, except when we started the Industrial Revol Revolution and started burning fossil fuels. We're now at almost 400 parts per million if we continue with our unsustainable business model and lifestyles, we'll be off the chart. We'll be at 600, possibly even more. Some people say 1,000 by mid-century. So scientists tell us in very clear terms that um, in order to avoid catastrophic and extreme climate change events, 
we need to return to a two, two degrees centigrade, uh, or we need to stay within a two degrees centigrade, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit guardrail, which means we need to return to what I call a safe level of carbon dioxide, which is 350 parts per million or possibly below that. In order to do that, we need to reduce the amount of carbon and greenhouse gas that we're emitting now. So let's take a look at that. New York State has, a, uh, has an executive order on the books already for a few years, I believe, since 2009, that says we need to reduce carbon emissions from our entire economy, from every sector of the economy, not just from the electric sector, 80% by mid-century, below 1990 levels. That's what we need to do in order to prevent the worst of climate impacts. Here in East Hampton, thanks to Larry Cantwell, our town supervisor, and the town board, the town has adopted a goal not on carbon emissions, but actually on making the shift from the fossil fuels that are causing climate change primarily to renewable energy sources that can help us prevent it. And the goal is that by 2020, we would be generating 100% of our energy, uh, of our electricity from renewable energy sources. And by 2030, the equivalent of 100% of all the other sectors. Let's look at how we can possibly do that. It's a tall order. Here are the carbon emissions in the town of East Hampton. And when, when we say town of East Hampton, we don't mean the town facilities. We can't blame it all on Larry Cantwell and the four other <laughs> town board members. Everybody here has a little bit to do with it, a lot to do with it, in fact. We uh, put, we dump about 370 mil, uh, metric tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every year. Electricity is the largest component of that, 51%. And then uh, transportation and heating, about a quarter, a little bit waste management, and a few other things. So obviously, we need to work very hard to get to an 80%, or at least an 80% reduction by mid-century. How can we do that? Well, if you just look at this, it, of course, makes sense that we start with the biggest chunk, the 51% of electricity. It also makes sense to do that because we have all the technologies, all the tools available today to generate electricity 100% from renewable energy sources like solar energy, wind energy, etc. I do this at, or I shouldn't say I, my wife and I do this at our home here in East Hampton. Uh, all of our electricity is generated from solar panels. So if we manage to do that between now and uh, 2020, we essentially make that block, that red uh, block, zero in terms of CO2 emissions. We've got most of our job done already, but we still need to work on the heating and transportation sector. And I imagine it's going to be a lot harder to do it in the heating and transportation sector because we still don't quite know how to fly airplanes on solar panels. We do know that we can fly airplanes and heat our homes and businesses with biofuels and that needs to be sustainably harvested by the fuels. We also know that we, we can, we can, we can uh, drive electric cars and even trucks and buses. But it's a lot easier, to, relatively speaking, to do this in the, in, the, in the electric sector than it is in the transportation sector. Let's take a look at what we've already done, what already has happened in the last 15 years or so. In 2000, uh, LIPA started a, uh, a solar pioneer program, incentivizing the installation of home and commercial uh, uh, solar electric systems. In the first year, there was one taker. There was one system installed in the town of East Hampton. Over the years, it started growing very nicely. By the end of uh, 2014, we had about 400 solar electric systems installed within the town borders here. We expect that to actually almost double or double uh, in 2015. We'll know this for sure by the end of the year. So we're doing pretty well here, right? Well, let's look at what we need to do and what we need to be. So we want to zoom out and see that by 2020, we need to be up there where the dotted line is to meet our annual consumption of 310,000 megawatt hours. A megawatt hour is 1,000 kilowatt hours. So we need to do a lot more. The colored bars here, this is just one model I've run so far. Um, there'll be many more models, so don't take this for, for gospel.
But um, one way to get there would be to increase, obviously, to put solar panels on every home and building that is suitable for it, that's got uninterrupted sunshine on the roof, and then to also make our buildings much more energy efficient. That's the gray bar, uh, all of our homes and buildings, to add utility scale solar, uh, uh, a parking lot, uh, uh, commercial uh, rooftops, and solar farms, uh, to, 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 uh, to add uh, wind power from an offshore or several offshore wind farms, and possibly to purchase green energy from other parts of the island. Right now, we're bringing in most of the fossil generated electricity from up island. We generate a little bit here in the summer with very dirty peaker plants here in Bill Lane, but uh, most of it has come, is, is brought in over the lines. What we are today is really at a crossroads. We have a choice here between sticking with the old business model that doesn't work and continue to do business as usual or to choose a clean energy future. Our town board, and I'm very proud of our town board, has taken the first step and shown a tremendous leadership to take the right fork here. What do we have in our toolbox to make this happen? Obviously, appliances are uh, typically old in many buildings, and when they get replaced, we have a unique opportunity to make sure that those appliances are top-notch energy efficient and at a minimum meet Energy Star requirements. We have to make sure that every home and every commercial building in, in, in the town of East Hampton is upgraded to top-notch energy efficiency standards so that we don't heat and cool the great outdoors in the winter and the summer. We can do that with extra insulation and making the homes and the buildings airtight. We can do that with solar uh, hot water heating systems, which we also have at home. And taking a shower this morning, you just it's just a wonderful feeling to know that that isn't done with oil or gas that came from halfway around the world, but with sunshine delivered right here at our doorstep or our rooftops. And it's free. Uh, we've already covered some solar here. You see larger scale solar arrays here. You see an offshore uh, a sketch of an offshore wind farm. We also need to, of course, look at the transportation sector and become a pedestrian and bike friendly uh, uh, neighborhood and town. We, uh, we need to uh, help people to charge up their electric vehicles that we're going to see more and more. And again, the town has shown tremendous leadership. We already have uh, an electric charging station at Town Hall. We need to think of creative ways to provide better mass transit solutions so that we don't all have to get in a car and burn fossil fuels when we have to get to work uh, or somewhere else. And of course, we need to eat locally produced food. I'm a men member of the Quail Hill Farm and proud of it. And I always pitch that because the typical American food molecule, I was once told, has traveled 1,500 miles by the time it lands on your dinner plate. And that's not sustainable, and that causes a lot of carbon emissions. The Europeans call this the great transformation from the fossil age to the clean energy, renewable energy age. The transformation from technologies of the 20th century, Edison invented this technology at the turn of the last century, to the technologies of today that can generate ample energy without dangerous carbon emissions. This has been done in many, many places around the world already, where people have gone 100% renewable. Just one example here, the island of Samsø, off the coast of Denmark. About 15 years ago or so, and this is written up, was written up in the uh, New Yorker. I encourage you to read that fascinating story. Folks over there decided they've had it with paying through the nose for fossil fuels. They had to run diesel generator to power, de generators to power their, their homes and businesses just like we do here, basically. They banded together, and they decided to build uh, offshore wind farms, solar panels, heating plants run on straw, and on and on and on. And within 10 years, they had made that transformation. They're now generating more renewable energy, both heating and electricity, than they can use. And they export, it, they export electricity to the mainland of Denmark. If you want to look what's going on around the world on 100% renewable energy communities, you can go to go100percent.org where you will see a map. And uh, I encourage you to read this. And East Hampton has been put on that map, and I'm very proud to say that. Um, here are just some more examples, whether it's communities, states, uh, 
uh, countries like Scotland um, or cities like San Francisco, who just set a 100% uh, goal a year ago or so. The city of Aspen just achieved its 100% renewable electricity uh, goal. The city of Greensburg, Kansas, wiped out by an F5 tornado, decided to be rebuild right and go 100%. And uh, Burlington, Vermont, our neighbor up to the north, has just achieved 100% renewable energy and now East Hampton. Here's another map. The World Future Council has put the town of East Hampton on its map as a leading force in the 100% renewable energy movement. And I think this can really make us proud. And I think this transformation that we have to undertake here to challenge, uh, to meet the challenge of climate change um, is not just um, that we are dealing with a crisis, but that we are facing this crisis head on and that we come together as a community and take pride and ownership in developing solutions to solve this problem. Arguably the largest crisis, the largest problem that mankind has ever faced in its short history. We need to find a solution to this problem. We are doing this, hoping to do this here in East Hampton. And I think if all of us, all of us come together and work together and make this happen, it's going to be a challenging undertaking. It's, a, it's an ambitious target, but an achievable target. But it'll take each and every one of us in this community to make that happen. Thank you very much. Shaw is the Environmental Protection Director of the East Hampton Towns Natural Resource Division. Gordian, Kim, and I work together as members of the Towns Energy Sustainability Committee and the Climate Action Plan Task Force. We will begin our conversation highlighting the working agenda from Kim's department. Following Following our conversation, you, it's your turn. So then we'll be ready for questions and answers. What we were looking at was significant environmental and public health issues related to uh, uh, overflowing septic systems and that wastewater entering our water bodies. So the plan is, uh, is complete, and now we're doing our tour of the town, working with communities, working, um, letting them know what we're recommending for their areas. We'll be in Springs in the next couple weeks talking to some groups, and then a large-scale meeting in downtown Montauk, talking to the business community and letting them know what are some possible solutions for uh, their wastewater needs. Uh, See, um, other projects that we've been working on have to deal with uh, watershed management plans. We recently completed watershed management plans for Lake Montauk and Three Mile Harbor. And we're currently partnering with the village to do a watershed management plan for Hook Pond. Georgia Pond is also uh, in our sites. Uh, we, just, uh, we have a group together that's working collaboratively to uh, seek grant funding to actually do some work there uh, probably in the next year or two. The town has also been a leader uh, in solar installations. We have, um, we answered an RFP through PSDNG, and we have selected three town properties to do solar installations. Uh, the town is gonna be leasing those properties to um, uh, Sun Edison, and the companies are actually on the properties today doing soil borings and preparing the site for installation this summer. So, uh, and with that comes not only the, so, the benefit of uh, reusing properties that were used as brush dumps, but it also gives revenues to the town through annual lease programs. Um, I'm also, well, the town, uh, my department has, since I got here, we worked on um, eight grant applications, totaling over just about $10 million. Uh, two of them are water quality um, initiatives where where I'm working in Three Mile Harbor and Akabonic with Cornell Cooperative Extension to do some passive uh, remediation in the form of permeable reactive barriers, uh, which help mitigate the concentration of nitrogen and pore water samples. So um, 
those two initiatives, uh, both are in contract. One's with Department of State, and the other is with Suffolk County. Several other projects that we have on the uh, boards are two coastal resiliency grants. Uh, one is funded through NYSERDA, and we uh, have contracted with an engineering firm out of Fairfax, Virginia, called Dewberry. And their grant um, is off and running, and that grant is off and running. We're a partner with them, along with New York Sea Grant. Jay Tansky is our local partner. And with that grant, we're actually doing uh, planning tools to help um, evaluate um, coastal erosion structures when they're presented to both our zoning and planning boards. So this will give our planners uh, additional tools to figure out uh, impacts associated with those structures. Um, Dewberry is also going to be doing an inventory of our coastline. It's going to be a pilot project here on Long Island. It's going to be one of the first. They're doing a set of um, analysis and um, a huge public, uh, pu public education awareness campaign. A lot of people just uh, aren't that aware of the impacts associated with our shore hardening structures. And, um, and Dewberry is going to help us uh, get that message out. A second grant that we have with New York State is um, a coastal resiliency grant that we're calling CARP, Coastal Assessment Resiliency Plan. And that is going to be more of an analysis or planning guideline, looking at our existing code, looking at our waterfront revitalization plan, and seeing w what areas can be revamped and upgraded. Um, uh, <laughs> they're also going to be a public education component of that. And uh, that uh, award hasn't been um, assigned yet. We are just uh, renegotiating the contract with the state, and we should be putting out an RFP to select a team to, to actually prepare the plan for the town. Uh, and then another large project we have been working on with uh, the USDA and the Natural Resources Conservation Service is a floodplain management plan. Uh, in that uh, proposal, East Hampton was selected uh, to um, buy out low-lying properties in the Lazy Point area. We have about just under 20 uh, properties that are involved in that, and that award was $9.9 .9 $9 million. Uh, we, are in, we have a cooperative agreement with the federal uh, government, and uh, mm -hmm. just waiting for that to get back in the town's hands. We have appraisers uh, on board ready to go out there. Um, once they appraise the property, if, if the homeowner accepts, uh, then the building will be demolished and the area will be revegetated and managed as a floodplain. The properties uh, involved in that program are both vacant and improved, and it, the um, area ranges from Bayside all the way back up uh, into the interior up to our main street. So uh, that's a project that we're really uh, uh, very proud of, and I think it's going to be just a, the first project in a long line of others looking at other low-lying areas, not only in Lazy Point, but maybe Girard Drive. I mean, we have enough flood, flood point areas that uh, we're not, you know, to seek grants for in the future. So it's a quick overview of everything we've sort of been working on. I'm sure I skipped over uh, others that are important, but those are some highlights. I think that... I think the applause for you, Kim, is also an, an introduction that allows us to know what our town is doing about the, meeting these challenges. And I can tell you that uh, communication in this initiative of making, of bringing our residents up to an understanding of what we are doing as a local community is critical at this point. My background, which you would have heard of had Sheila been able to give her introduction, <laughs> uh, since I'm now going to have to introduce myself, um, my background has been with the Garden Club of America as their conservation vice chairman. My portfolio has been climate change for the last four years. Uh, this has allowed me to prepare a learning curve to and an exposure to the various political dialogues that are associated with uh, climate change. And what I know now is that the action is here. It's at home. So it is important for us 
to participate and to share with everyone in our community what our role can be. You, the audience, have this responsibility also along with the leadership. Hats off to the town, hats off to the village. Now let's hear from you. So we're willing, we're ready to take questions. Um, And let me know who you want uh, to direct your question to. Yes, great, great question. Um, in 15 minutes, I couldn't cover all of that. There are great rebate it's, programs it's yours available for, uh, for homeowners, for business owners, for municipalities, pretty much for everything you can think of to improve energy efficiency in your home or in your building. Uh, New, York New York City uh, and the rest of the state um, you go to uh, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research Development Authority, just rolls off the tongue. Uh, but you can go to NYSERDA.org uh, and find the energy efficiency uh, incentives that are available from the state. Uh, you could also call or contact Con Edison, and they should be able to tell you about uh, where to go to get that. You're welcome. In the back. Well, the black and white answer is yes. I mean, 90% of New York City's wetlands have been destroyed over the last 100 years as a result of development. And if we had those wetlands back, which we're not going to get back, we would have greater buffering and protection, that is for sure. The more complex response is that, you know, with um, 80, ultimately the projections for 70 to 80 percent of the world living in urban centers and metropolises, that what we have to understand ahead of us and plan for with such density of people in these areas, how can we create safe and healthy places for that compression of people and then use other areas that are surrounding these metropolises both in restoring them conserving them, preserving them, that will have a direct impact on us too. But as I said, the direct and literal answer to you is yes, that is correct. And I'm only referring to wetlands. You can also talk about our forest land and our grasslands and our fresh waters too. We've lost all of them. And one of the projects that we have been looking at in New York City is what's called daylighting. And I'm not sure it's a term you're familiar with. But it is literally daylighting creeks, streams, rivers and brooks that were buried by development over the last 200 and 300 years, daylighting them, hence the term, um, using them in our case for a mixture of stormwater management, um, which is extremely important. And obviously, in East Hampton is focusing on that too. So as we think about climate change, we need to think about um, one side of the watershed, which is the ocean or bay side, and all the storms coming in. We also need to think about all the water that trickles down the watershed, and if you can capture that through green infrastructure and infrastructure transformation, you're doing a good job on both ends. So we're thinking about all these types of restorations. Bram, let me just also uh, build on that. Let's think about this as we look forward to what we can do here in our own community. We know the mistakes that have been made in the past, and we know what we are paying for that now. But we have an opportunity here now to do a better job for the future. And I think that's a very important part and a very important um, initiative or reason for us to be that much more involved and invested in what we can do. Next question. Well, take your pick. <laughs> we went to, uh, thank the entire panel for coming here today and enlightening us and volunteering your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a question perhaps directed at Dan and also at William. While the scientists may be the folks who announce climate change for the world, I think that uh, we have seen it degenerate into a political argument. 
All too often we have, let's say, Republicans at one end, the Democrats and the others at the other end, deniers, alarmists, etc. So in your efforts to bring a community together, how do you overcome this polarization? Thank you. I think that's an excellent question. And as a scientist, it's when you come out into the public, always a thought in your mind. The way I present, approach the problem as a scientist is looking at the past, looking at what's happening presently. We know we're vulnerable. I don't think, regardless of what you believe or regardless of what is causing the problem, that's a separate piece of the conversation. We face climate risk. We see the storms. You know. Drive 15 miles and see Shinnecock Inlet. That was cut during a hurricane. Drive into the flooded communities when Sandy came and you could see the water here. Those storms, you know, our current climate risks are only going to continue into the future. And not even taking change into the picture here, we're always going to remain vulnerable. And our vulnerability necessitates a response because we have an opportunity to build a better and a more resilient future to protect loss from occurring later on. You can either approach the problem, defend ourselves now so that if an event happens in the future, you're protected, or you're, it's reactionary. You have to respond after that event. And as we engage in further growth and starting new projects and new development, now is the time to bring climate and our risk into play. Um, Yes, they're the political components of how we should respond and what's responsible for climate change. It doesn't take away from what we've seen in the past and what we know we're facing, and especially true in a coastal community where a current day storm, a current nor'easter floods areas or causes wind damage. And in the summer, heat waves are a extreme risk for us. And we're very dry right now. And on the drive out from further west, you can notice that. And there's a wildfire risk. These are all risks we face today. And that, I think that that's a striking point for me, is that we understand them and we have a chance to better ourselves for the future. Gordian? Well, just very briefly, the, uh, to just emphasize the point that Dan made, that climate change is not a religion or a belief system that you can choose. Uh, somebody said, uh, uh, you know, glaciers and polar ice doesn't believe in climate change or disputes climate change. It doesn't read the papers. It just melts. And you can't argue with that. I don't mean to sound Pollyanna, but the, for me, the ultimate answer to that question is community engagement and community education. And we have all, Linda described it, Gordian described it, Dan described it, and Amanda was describing it. We're all very focused in our work now in a way that we weren't even five years ago on making sure that there's a community feedback loop and appropriate ways, and I think it's different for every community, to understand how real it is. And one of the things that we are trying to do in my division within the Parks Department is try to pe have people relate to each other through a watershed. And instead of the political boundaries that were sliced up when New York City was forming hundreds of years ago, um, and some of them are arbitrary, some of them are not. But if you associate yourself as part of a watershed, then you are directly concerned about where that water is traveling every day and how does it affect your home. And that we are finding that has real resonance for people and neighborhoods and more. And so the, first, the thing that we have done just in the last year for the first time ever, our land management division has a stewardship team. We've never done that before. We've always done our work as land managers. We collect the information, we get our capital money, and we do our work. Now we have a stewardship division that's fanning out into neighborhoods across the city, just talking with people, bringing them into these spaces, and asking them for some type of help in maintaining these beautiful spots. And it's having great and a profound effect. So I just wanted to add that. Question? And uh, what they did there, uh, this is going to be a question. Uh, well, we're going to. 
Larry? <laughs> no, it has to come sooner than that. Grassland, and uh, which was protected by a berm, they removed the berm uh, for 100 acres, and the 100 acres came back into tidal wetlands because they have lost spot pine. And the forest. question is, Larry? The question is, uh, it came back into it without any kind of planting, it came back into a wonderful wetland. So I, I'm sitting next to someone who, who is way out of this field. Uh, her name is Karen Bowman. She wrote the book. Uh, uh, Long Island native plants and uh, their use in landscaping, and she has an interesting novel theory, and I think there's something to it. If you just let, I don't hear a question. Yeah, a question. Larry, I hear. I need a question. The question is, if you just let a piece of vacant land uh, come up by its own, there's a good chance. What is the chance that it'll come back in a in like you know, that wetland in California, like a good native habitat? We got it. <laughs> I, I can only talk, of course, about New York City, but our experience in New York City is because of um, the invasive plant species, that if we do not practice some level of management, if we just leave a site alone, which we have done over time, because we don't have capital money to restore it or manage it, that the invasive species take over. So what our plan is, what, what we have been doing and what our plans are, but this is changing because of the science that is constantly sort of feeding into our thinking, is we have capital money for site preparation. We have 10,000 acres of natural areas, as I said before, within the parks portfolio. It usually takes two years of site preparation to rid that area, whatever. It could be an acre. It could be 40 acres to rid them of invasive species. We then plant strictly natives that are primarily grown through our native plant center. It's a 14-acre nursery on Staten Island where all the plants are generated from the collection of local seeds. We plant that, and it takes about three to five years of management post-planting before we feel confident that there's some level of self-sufficiency. That's our trajectory. We're working in New York City. It is absolutely different if you're working in Columbia County or areas that are more rural, but we have tried that experiment and it has not worked, but we are devotees of native plants. <laughs> Thank you. And I, one more question. I was waiting for that question. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> the simple answer is we're a drop in the bucket, right? But the bucket is only going to get full if everybody puts a drop in. So we need to do our share and we need to show leadership. Because if a community like East Hampton doesn't show leadership in the face of this threat that threatens life as we know it and our shorelines and the beauty and the wealth of this community, if we can't muster an adequate response and a, and a, and a fast response to them, how will people in Bangladesh tackle this issue? And that goes for not just this community, but pretty much the developing world, the developed world, the United States, Europe, and many other countries that need to take the bull by the horn, show leadership, and help the rest of the world and show the rest of the world that we need to do this now. We have a decade, maybe two, maybe three, to solve this. But somebody's got to start. And there are hundreds of communities now who are not waiting for their elected officials and their capital to tackle this, but who are taking grassroots action at the local level. Kevin, last question. Thank you for coming to Howard Thank you, everyone, the panelists. And I'd like to acknowledge the supervisor and Kim for their leadership with cultural resiliency and waste water. <laughs> While sea level rise is a bit abstract as to, um, I guess, perfecting the numbers, 
Uh, is there any information or data looking at uh, saltwater intrusion as a, as a response to sea, rising sea level? And particularly as, as groundwater comes up, the influences, of course, on our septic supply or our septic systems and other contaminants. So um, perhaps some of the panelists could, could address that. The short answer from, from my knowledge of things is absolutely a, a valid concern, saltwater intrusion and the changing in the water table. I don't know the specifics for Long Island and how that may, may interfere. Um, we looked at it in New York City and how the salt front on the, up the Hudson would change potentially with sea level rise. So I don't know the specifics, but it certainly is an active area of our research and something we're looking to, to investigate further. What we do know here in our community is we have a sole source aquifer and that aquifer and I don't want to open another discussion because we haven't got the time we know that aquifer is challenged too and this has nothing to do with climate change but it's sole source that's our water supply and with that and a few minutes to spare Sheila <laughs> Brooke well, now that Linda James has introduced herself, I don't have to do that. <laughs> we thank our wonderful speakers for being here with us today. I especially want to thank Brooke Kroger, who has done such a fabulous job in organizing the Tom Toomey Lecture Series. Next week, we're going to have a lecture on ticks and the immune system, uh, given by Dr. George Dempsey, who's a practitioner in East Hampton. And since I work with Dr. Dempsey, he has sworn me to secrecy that he actually has some new information for us. So I, I would encourage everybody to come next week. So thank you again, everybody. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dennis Fabzak, who's going to talk about the East Hampton Library. Uh, about doing things that would help protect the environment, conserve energy, uh, and also serve as, as a, an, a learning center or an example for the community. It was just in line with what the town board has declared to do. Uh, all of the lighting in the addition, including this room, is LED. We have geothermal heating and cooling. We have a high efficiency gas unit that we replace an old oil tank and gotten rid of an old burner with. Um, we've done great insulation. We have a clay tile roof. <coughs> Um, and we have solar panels on the roof, and we're interested in doing more things and hope that you'll encourage the town and the village to look at this site as an example site and a place that uh, things like that can be tested and people can come and see them and ask questions about them and vendors can show us different examples of them. Um, and maybe, you know, even a place that vendors can come to, to demonstrate their things and, and place bids with the town that the town could then open up for the re local residents to purchase from, not just municipal buildings. You know, we were going through the project, and, and at the same time, the town was discussing uh, making this, this statement that by the year 2020, we'd be energy, 100% you know, uh, of our energy would be covered. Um, but we had to go out and do all, all of our own bidding. We had to look at all of the solar companies that were out there, figure out what we thought was the best thing to do. Uh, it would be great if, if on our local governmental level uh, that was worked out for us with the best possible price town-wide, regardless of if you're an individual uh, or a municipality, uh, and that there was a place like the library, which is here for everybody and open every day of the year, uh, where you could come and see it and touch it and feel it and, and ask the vendors about it uh, and, and really help move things forward. So I hope you'll encourage everybody to do that and look at what we have here. Thank you.